I am so glad that you've joined us for Huntersville Presbyterian Church Online. And I know some of you are here every week, and it is so good to see you again. And some of you might be here for the very first time. Uh, my hope is that all of you will discover what we have discovered, that life really is better with Jesus because he makes us better at life. And our vision is to be a community where we are learning and sharing that better way to live. At the end of our time together today, we're going to celebrate communion, and I'm going to invite you to do that wherever you might be. All that you need is to find some bread, and just ordinary bread will do. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. This is what Jesus used, just the ordinary bread around the house, and a cup of juice. And again, it doesn't have to be anything special. Anything that's the fruit of the vine will work. Now, go ahead and, and have those ready with you so you'll be able to share in communion together when we get to the very end of the service. Uh, before we get there, I want to thank all of you again who have been so faithful in your generosity towards God's work at Huntersville Presbyterian. Uh, your gifts, your financial contributions, they are making a difference. And so thank you for that. If you would like to make a financial contribution today, you can do it on our website. Just click the Give tab. There you'll also find information about how to mail in a gift to the church. Uh, before we get into the message, I wanted us just to take a moment. Uh, I have been talking to a lot of teachers over the past several days, and teachers are pouring so much into our students and the schools this year, and they are so deserving of our appreciation. And so we just want to take a moment to give thanks for our teachers and to pray for God's blessings on them. And so we're going to do that with a short video and then a time of prayer. So take a look at the video and then join with me in prayer. Lord, I am so grateful for teachers. We are all so grateful for our teachers, for the ways that they invest in the lives of students and of parents, for the ways that they are helping students learn more about you and more about this incredible world and universe that you have created. Lord, I pray that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them, that you would sustain them, that you would provide them with all the resources that they need. Lord, that you would protect them as they teach. Lord, would they know how much we value and appreciate them? So, Lord, I pray that you would just shower all of our teachers and their families with the, all of the blessings of heaven. And, Lord, as we open your word today, we, we want to learn from it. So, would you open our hearts to truths that you would teach us? For we ask it all, Lord Jesus, in your name and for your glory alone. Amen. We're in a series, Learning to Follow Jesus, with the goal of learning to live and love the way that he did. Uh, so far, he's reminded us that he believes in us. That's why Jesus calls us to be his disciples. We are blessed because of our relationship with him, and we are distinctive difference makers as we reflect his light by putting others above ourselves. Last week, we learned that Jesus calls us to learn and practice what God has commanded. And now he begins to give us some practical examples, starting with a topic that I believe impacts all of us, the danger of anger. 
And we all face this danger. Uh, Jesus says, you know the command, thou shalt not murder. Now, let me take it to an entirely new level. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister, and the words here are meant to describe someone who's also a disciple, a follower of Jesus, anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is an Aramaic insult that meant empty-headed, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, let me ask you, have you ever gotten angry with someone? Ever called anyone a fool? I mean, we all have. We all get angry, and there's a danger when we do. Uh, Jesus says that we're in danger of the fires of hell, and, and that's an eternal consequence which we need to take seriously. But there's also immediate dangers. Uh, the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs tells us, as churning cream produces butter and twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. Anger produces strife, and it stirs up conflict that damages our relationships. And so we have to learn a better way to address our anger and the conflict it creates. And to tackle it head on. Uh, you've probably heard the saying, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. If we don't deal with our anger... If we don't find a way to let it go, it builds and it can destroy marriages and friendships and even communities. Because again, and, and this is the danger of anger, anger leads to strife and creates conflict that can be so destructive. And here's what I just discovered. Uh, we can't prevent ourselves from becoming angry, uh, but we can learn to manage our anger and the conflict it creates in healthy ways. And because when we do, when we manage our conflict in a healthy way, it frees us so that we can let go of our anger. And I've also discovered that we tend to deal with conflict differently. Uh, I learned this lesson firsthand not long after my wife Kim and I got married. Uh, I grew up in a con family that was, we were all conflict avoiders. Uh, in my family, we just ignored everything. We would walk away. We just wouldn't talk about it. Uh, and one author has described this sort of behavior as acting like a turtle. Uh, when turtles encounter conflict, they withdraw into their shells, and I was very good at being a turtle. Uh, Kim, on the other hand, grew up in a family that was very healthy with the way they dealt with conflict. They did it out in the open, and, and if you want to stick with animal analogies, uh, Kim grew up in a family of gorillas. And gorillas don't mind mixing it up a little, and they like to get things out in the open where they can deal with them. And if you need an animal approach to the way you deal with anger, I mean, you might be an owl. Owls intellectualize everything. It doesn't matter how you feel to an owl. They just want to stick to the facts. Uh, or you might be a chameleon. You just change and adapt whatever the conflict might be. You keep the peace. My favorite is a skunk. A skunk gets angry and threatened, and so they just spray at you, usually harsh words that sting. And, and some people are combinations. Over the years, I've known a few skirtles who spray a little sarcasm and then run and, and hide in their shell. Uh, anyway, we got married, and this turtle and this gorilla had to learn how to deal with conflict. And you can imagine the first time we had a fight. And I couldn't begin to tell you what the argument was about. But I will never forget my response because I was the perfect turtle. Uh, we were in the kitchen, and I just walked out and went to bed. Right in the middle of our discussion, I just turned around, walked out, turned off the lights, and crawled into bed, leaving Kim standing alone in the kitchen. Now, gorillas can't stand that sort of behavior. And so Kim comes into the bedroom, flips on the light, and announces to the turtle, we're not finished. Turtles know exactly how to respond to that sort of threat. I rolled over, buried my head under the pillow, which for a gorilla is an invitation to engage. 
And Kim walked over and pulled the pillow off of me and started beating me with it, which caused both of us to start laughing over how silly our argument was. Now, over 36 years of marriage, we have gotten so much better at dealing with conflict, and I am much less the turtle that I used to be, and I have learned to never refer to my wife as a gorilla. Uh, but we still, from time to time, have conflict. We always will. We all will. We're all going to get angry at times. And, and sometimes we're going to get angry at those who are closest to us, our sisters and our brothers, and our anger is going to create strife and conflict. Now, thankfully, Jesus knew that we would get angry, and Jesus knew that if we dealt with the conflict in a healthy way, well, then we'd be able to let go of our anger. So here in this Sermon on the Mountainside, Jesus gives us some practical direction on how to deal with conflict when we're angry at someone, especially someone who's close to us. And then later on, he's going to expound on the lesson. And Matthew recorded that as well in chapter 18. So we're going to look at both of these passages, and Jesus is going to teach us a better way to deal with conflict so that we can manage our anger. And to help us remember, Jesus is going to challenge us to make the right decision at five crossroads. So, here's the first decision you have to make. And you find it in Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins against you, go. So, here's the first crossroad, the first decision that we have to make. You have to decide whether to go or say nothing. Now, if you want, you can hide your head under the pillow or you can decide to turn on the light. And the truth is, most of us would rather hide our heads under the pillow. I mean, most of us have gotten pretty good at conflict avoidance. But Jesus says the better way is to go. You see, whenever there is conflict, regardless of who's at fault, Jesus puts the burden on us, on, on you and, and on me, to be the ones to initiate reconciliation. If we avoid facing the conflict, there, there's always a cost involved. Uh, there's a cost to the relationship because it never has a chance to be restored. And there's also a cost to how we feel about ourselves. Uh, when we approach difficult situations head on, uh, even if they aren't resolved, but we decide to pull our head out from under the pillow and we go, uh, what happens is that we grow stronger and more confident. But every time we make the decision to avoid conflict, something inside us dies just a little. And so the first decision we need to make whenever we get angry, whenever we encounter conflict, is will we go? Now, if we decide to go, that brings us to a second crossroad. After deciding to go, we have to decide where to go. And we can either go to the person or to someone else. Jesus says, if your brother or your sister sins against you, go and show him or her. Every time we get angry, we have to make a decision. Are we going to go to the person we are angry with, or are we going to engage in gossip? And, and you know how this works. I mean, take the example of the argument that Kim and I had. When I walked out of the room, instead of following me, she could have called her mom uh, or she could have called a friend and rehashed our argument. And she could have made the decision to go, but instead of coming to me, she could have gone to someone else. And a lot of us are guilty of this. I mean, the temptation is to go to someone else and tell them all about the conflict and tell them why we're angry. The Bible calls it gossip. And it's wrong, and, and we're so much better than this. So our decision is to not gossip. Instead, we're going to go directly to the person that we're angry with, the, the person we have conflict with. And if you're willing to make that decision, it will bring you to a, a third crossroad, where either you will tell the truth or dance around the issue. 
if your brother or sister sins against you, go and show him or her his or her fault. Uh, and the goal here is without attacking or blaming or avoiding the real issues that we share as clearly as we can why we're angry and, and how we feel about what has happened and how it's affected our relationship. Uh, the temptation for, for so many of us is to dance around the issue and, and we'll use phrases like, well, that's okay, or, or I'm fine, or it doesn't really matter, uh, when the truth is it does matter and it's not okay and I am anything but fine. And in order to resolve conflict, we have to be willing to tell the truth, to name the issue. When we go, we need to be ready to speak calmly, because our tone is so important, to speak calmly the truth in love. And that'll bring us to a, a fourth crossroad decision, either to resolve the conflict in private or make it public. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and show him or her, his or her fault, just between the two of you. Resist the temptation to take the conflict public. Go and meet them face to face, just the two of you, in private. You don't bring it up at a dinner party. You don't discuss it with your small group in, in order to get everyone else to agree with you about how awful this person has been. You certainly don't post anything on social media. You, just, you don't get a whole bunch of other people involved gossiping about what happened. You go to them in private and you work it out there. Now, later Jesus does open the door to invite others into a process, but it's only as a last resort, and it's after we have tried to work things out privately first. Now, if we'll do that, it will bring us to a fifth crossroad where we have to decide whether we are going to seek reconciliation or remain separated. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and show him or her, his or her fault, just between the two of you. If he or she listens to you, you have won your brother or sister over. In other words, you will have resolved the conflict and reconciled the relationship. The decision is to go with the right spirit. Uh, with a reconciling spirit, with the goal of restoring the relationship so that you can let go of your anger. So let me give you an illustration of what these steps might look like in practice. Uh, for years and years, I coached middle school basketball, and one year we had a pretty good team, and uh, we were making a deep playoff run, and we found ourselves in a game that went to double overtime. And it was a tense situation. And in the first overtime, the referee made what at the time I thought was a horrible call right in front of me. And I didn't react to the call particularly well. You might say that I sinned against my brother, certainly in thought, if not in deed. Uh, the other coach called a timeout. And during which the referee did this wonderful thing. He came over to me, and he pulled me aside privately, and he calmly explained why his call was correct, and he helped me to understand the fault in my reaction. But you know, he didn't ignore me, even though I was doing my best to try to ignore him. In fact, he made a point of coming to me. And he didn't go to the other referee and, and point out what an idiot I was, and he didn't announce that, announce that to the parents who were watching the game. Instead, what he did, in private, he told me the truth. And in doing so, he won me over, and the conflict between us was resolved, and I let go of my anger toward him. Now, listen, I, I know that's a simplistic example, and I know that most of the conflicts in our lives, uh, the stakes are so much higher than a, a middle school basketball game, uh, and the situations are just messier and more complicated. 
And I know that some of you are facing conflict right now in your marriages, and maybe you're wondering if you're going to be able to stay together. Or some of you are facing conflict that has you separated from someone that you care about. And the pain of that separation, it's killing you. And there are situations that, that many of you might be facing that, that, again, they're more complicated. The stakes are so much higher than a middle school basketball game. But the principles that Jesus offers, I mean, they still apply. And they really will work if we make the right decisions. Now, let me add, there are going to be some broken relationships in our lives where for whatever reason, it would be inappropriate or it might be impossible to go to that person and seek to resolve the conflict face to face. Uh, it might be a former spouse where if you were to go to see them, uh, it would not be helpful to their or your current circumstances. Uh, or for some people, it might actually be an abusive relationship, and it would be dangerous for you to see them again. And sometimes the, the person that you're angry with might be dead or gone, and, and you just can't go to them at all, but there's still a hurt that remains. Uh, and, and remember, this teaching is especially for relationships within the family of God. And in some relationships outside of the family of God, our efforts might never be received. But in all those cases, there is something that we can do. Uh, we can bring that broken relationship to God in prayer, and God can move us to a place of healing where the anger and the pain of the conflict will no longer consume us. You see, even in those relationships where the conflict is never resolved between us, we can still find the power to forgive. And I know that there are some situations where resolving the conflict might feel like it's inappropriate or impossible. So I wanted just to caveat all of that. But for most of us, it's not the case. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how we feel, and, and, and maybe we've tried and we've tried and, and we keep getting rejected. Uh, for a lot of us, we need to try again. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter how difficult the idea of going and speaking the truth in love might seem. Because resolving conflict is so important. Letting go of our anger is so important. In fact, it is so important that Jesus says... If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother or sister. You know, in Jesus' day, the rules that governed worship were so rigid, no one would ever consider leaving a worship service early. But here Jesus does what his hearers would have thought was unthinkable. Get up in the middle of the worship service, climb over as many people as necessary, head for the exits, provided you are leaving for the right reason to fix a broken relationship, to resolve a conflict, to let go of your anger, because it is just that important. So let me ask you this, whose face has been coming to mind since this message began? Uh, who are you angry with and, and how is that anger stirring up strife and, and creating conflict? I mean, it might be a spouse or, or a son or a daughter or, or a parent, it might be a colleague at work or a classmate at school, or, or it might be a friend. Jesus would say to you, there is danger to your anger, and so you need to deal with it right now. And if there is conflict that needs to be resolved, don't wait. Please don't wait. Relationships are just too important. So make a phone call. Take them to lunch. Go over to their office or, or go to their home. Uh, if necessary, just get up right now and, and, and go to them and, and listen and speak the truth, and pursue reconciliation. But don't put it off. Don't wait. It's a better way to live in love. And it reflects what God did for us, a truth that we are reminded of every time we celebrate communion. 
You see, there's conflict between God and, and creation. Conflict between God and you and me. And that conflict separates us from God be, because of the sin in the world and the sin in our lives. And our sin rightly stirs God's anger and wrath. Uh, one Old Testament prophet, a prophet Isaiah said, The day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. In anger, God could have just destroyed us, or he could have chosen to ignore the conflict and avoid us, just leave us on our own to do the best we could. But God so loved the world, God so loved you, that he chose a different response. I love the way the New Testament describes it. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of wrath and anger, God chose to come to us, to come in the person of Jesus Christ, to come and speak truth, to show us our faults, to show us our desperate need for him. And when we celebrate communion, we are visibly reminded of how far Jesus was willing to go to come and fix our broken relationship. And even though the conflict was between us, uh, and caused by us, Jesus didn't wait for us to come to him. He took the costly first step of coming to us. He, he left behind the glory of heaven, and he sacrificed his life on a cross so that we might be reconciled with God because resolving conflict was that important to Jesus. And the empowering good news that we celebrate is that Jesus still has the power to resolve conflict to bring people together, to reestablish love when love has been broken. And he has made that power available to you and to me. So today we're going to celebrate communion. And, and I want to invite you to do two things. Uh, first, if there is anger that you need to let go of, and that anger is creating strife and conflict in a relationship, take a moment to ask God help you to resolve the conflict so that you can let go of the anger. And then secondly, because forgiven people forgive people, take a moment just to thank God for loving you so much that he has resolved the conflict that our sins created. Thank him that because of what Jesus did on the cross, you and I, we are forgiven. And so would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you that you do, that, that you love us so much that you came to us to resolve the broken relationship, to resolve the conflict between heaven and earth. And that because of your sacrifice on a cross, Lord, we are forgiven. And you have restored the relationship. And so, Lord, today, as we break bread and we share a cup, Lord, will you use these everyday elements to remind us of a love that sets us free to live for you. We pray all of that, Lord Jesus, and we do it in your holy name. Amen. If you have bread with you, I'd invite you to take it now. Just ordinary bread, because that's what Jesus used. And break it, and then take just a little piece, and we'll share it together. And I invite you to remember that this is the body of Christ, which was broken for you. Let's share the bread together. And then I'd invite you to take a cup. Uh, the cup, Jesus said, was a cup of a new covenant. A covenant that was sealed in his blood, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And so we take the cup as a reminder that we are forgiven. And again, just an ordinary cup would do and any juice that you have around the house. But may the cup, as we share it together, be a reminder of the forgiveness that is possible through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that, um, that the bread and the juice remind us of the depths of your love for us and our desperate need for it. Lord, may that memory encourage us 
as we seek to live for you, as we seek to be your salt and light in the world, as we learn to be your disciples, following you, living and loving the way that you did. Lord, may the reminder of your love for us and, and the ways that you have restored the conflict in our lives, uh, Lord, would that enable us to restore the conflict that we have with one another. And we can't do that by our own power. So, Lord, we'd ask for your Holy Spirit to empower us to help us accomplish that. And we pray all of that, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you again for joining us for Huntersville Presbyterian Church Online. Next week, we are going to continue to work our way through this sermon on the mountainside. And I hope that you will join us then. Between now and then, I pray that you will experience all of God's blessings this week. And you will know that wherever you go, you are not alone because our living Lord Jesus Christ, he goes with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and may he go before you to show you his way now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Take care.